Hey, thanks a lot, the organizers, for inviting me. Uh, I feel a bit like I've taken someone from the zoo and put them somewhere else. Um, so I looked through the speaker list, and it seems like I'm the only one who is still at some university. Uh, ah, one more, okay. So I understand many of you have <laughs> probably been at some university, and then you, you, you escaped. Uh, <clears throat> so I didn't. Uh, but I learned from the previous talk that um, if you have a research team, and if you have five years, then you can do fantastic things. And so I have a research team, and we have roughly five years. So let's see what comes out. Um, so this is a project that uh, is very much in its infancy. So um, we have a, uh, I have a WASP PhD student, Jimmy, who is here. And we have a collaboration with uh, Robert Biermann, who is uh, also at the math department at Chalmers, and Fredrik Olsson uh, at Rice, but he's also uh, visiting Chalmers at the moment, and Christopher Peterson at Sinuity. And um, so when I gave this title to the organizers, or to Joseph, he said, oh, but you're just putting together fancy words. And, and indeed, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, so, he, so I have sort of a longer title, but it's... I won't have time to, to say anything about this anyway. Um, but so I have a background in uh, theoretical physics and mathematics, so I guess at the moment I would classify myself as a mathematical physicist or a physical mathematician. And um, <coughs> so usually when I give talks, I sort of show this slide. So that's what I've been working on a lot, uh, understanding uh, sort of unifying the laws of nature, and in particular trying to, to uh, understand what a quantum theory of gravity is. And so for this conference, I just you know, took the same slide and I just switched the picture and I said, we want to have a unified description of the laws of AI. So we, of course, we're looking for a quantum theory of machine learning. Um, so does that even make sense? And uh, why is it of interest to you? Um, so I should say that um, our main motivation at the moment is not so much producing some kind of new algorithm or a product that you guys can use, but trying to understand somehow the basic structures of, of AI or maybe deep learning in particular, what makes it work, why, uh, why does it generalize so well and so on. And it seems that you can actually uh, gain a lot of traction by looking at uh, or getting some inspiration from, from physics. Um, <clears throat> so let me just say something about the role of Wallenberg in this. So they, they seem to be very good at picking up uh, <coughs> sort of things that are at the moment very hot topics. So in the last few years, um, Wallenberg launched two very big uh, investments in Sweden. Uh, one was Wallenberg Center for Quantum Technology, or VACT. And the goal there is to build a quantum computer in the foreseeable future. And they launched VASP, and which is the focus is, is originally was more on autonomous driving, and then they've sort of reinvented this uh, <coughs> a few times. And they started shifting focus on AI, and, and then the very recent uh, call was for the mathematical foundations of AI, which is where I and many others uh, in sort of academia became very interested, in particular mathematicians and physicists. And uh, so if you combine these two, there is some intersection here, and that's sort of where quantum machine learning is supposed to live. Now, it's not really a well-defined term, and we don't really know what it is, so don't expect an answer. Uh, but it really depends on who you ask. So uh, some people consider this to be a topic where you use, say, machine learning techniques to uh, understand something about physics. Some modeling problem, for instance. Uh, <coughs> quantum many-body systems is a, is a topic that has been uh, closely tied to these kind of ideas in, in, in recent years. Um, well, there's also what some people call, in particular in, in the VACT 
uh, side of the story to try to use quantum computers to sort of improve training of, of uh, algorithms for deep neural networks. Um, from a more basic point of view, you can ask, you know, is it interesting to think about what is a quantum deep neural network? Is it possible to consider such an object and, and could it be interesting? Um, from my point of view, I would like to sort of stress this, this uh, perspective here that you can uh, actually uh, use principles, techniques, ideas from uh, physics, quantum physics, statistical physics, to try to understand deep neural networks. And that's kind of been my approach or our approach in our project. Um, <coughs> So, following the common practice of theoretical physicists, I created far too many slides, so I will never have time to cover all of the stuff that I had. Um, but you can think of me as sort of an autoencoder, so I'm compressing the information by just skipping a bunch of slides, and you will anyway get the main message, I hope. Um, <coughs> so, um, so, the way I think about this is that we have uh, sort of machine learning and we have physics, and we can use uh, ideas from one or the other to, uh, to make progress. And from, from the point of view of physics, there are many uh, subjects that seem that they can, uh, you can uh, gain some insight into machine learning or deep learning. In particular, from the point of view of information theory, dynamical systems, you can talk about symmetries, you know about translation invariant neural networks. Very often in physics, where you have some kind of symmetry, you have some conservation law, and you can think about whether you can transport those kind of ideas into machine learning. On the other hand, you can also think about using uh, machine learning to model complex systems in physics, like quantum media body problems and so on. And so there's this kind of interaction here. And of course, underlying all this, there is some uh, mathematics, and what we're really looking for is somehow what are the principles that, uh, that really get uh, neural networks going and how can we understand why some things work much better than others and so on. And so this is really kind of very new from the point of view of mathematics in Gothenburg. So like one year ago, we didn't really have sort of a research direction in the math department. And now we have four uh, WASP students we are recruiting an assistant professor, tenure track assistant professor in this area, who will hire a PhD student and two postdocs. And so it's kind of just exploding. And so I think it's very exciting. And it got me talking to people from other parts of the math department and other parts of Chalmers. And now I'm here talking to you guys. So this is something that is really uh, exciting. Um, so I will try to say a little bit about what we're trying to do in our project. So it will be more of a overview of how sort of ideas from, from physics and quantum theory can be, what kind of uh, questions you can ask and so on. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, let me just say that our focus has been to try and, trying to understand unsupervised learning. Uh, in contrast to having uh, some annotated data, here you train with some unlabeled data and the goal is sort of to try to find some uh, model distribution, p of lambda, that depends on some parameters. And the data that you get is drawn from some unknown distribution p. And we want to have some kind of way of modeling p lambda. So we want to solve some optimization problem. We have some to choose some kind of loss function, which we want to minimize. And so the main uh, idea here is that we want to be able to draw new samples from this kind of model distribution. And so there have been a lot of successes with GANs and so on in recent years, and we want to try to understand in what way this, this unsupervised learning can gain insights from physics. There are many situations in physics where you want to do something very similar. So uh, testing ground for this, which is also a very nice way of getting into the subject for a physicist, is to look at so-called Boltzmann machines. Uh, so let me just spend one slide saying something about these. Uh, so this is really coming from Hinton. Actually, there were other collaborators that I didn't remember, so I just put Hinton, so I apologize to them. Um, but this is based on uh, simple graphs. So you take a bipartite graph, 
and you assume that there are no intralayer connections in, uh, in each two layers, and we think of one of them as visible or the data, and then you have one hidden layer. So these are like neurons if you want. You can think of them as taking values plus minus one or zero or one if you prefer. And uh, we want to try to model some true distribution which is unknown, that we don't know. And the way to do this in this setting is to set up sort of an ansatz for some probability distribution P that depends on some parameters lambda, so like the, the weights of the system. So you won't understand what this is because I removed the slide, so I apologize for that. But the idea is that this whole thing is set up uh, as depending on some function E, which is usually called the energy function in machine learning literature or the Hamiltonian in, in physics. And the whole setup is inspired by an ISIG model, where you have sort of spins up and down, and maybe you think of this energy function as encoding some interactions. Um, <coughs> So this is really supposed to be a, a, a nice model for unsupervised learning where you can generate uh, new samples from this model distribution. And what really got me very fascinated about this is that there are sort of, when you combine this kind of simplified models of just two layers like this, you can construct a deep network by putting all these things together. And you have this notion of pre-training, that you can train one of these restricted Boltzmann machines where the, sort of the output becomes the input of the next one. And you cook everything into a, a neural network. And so I'm going to skip one slide here. And the sort of output of this is that you have a sequence of probability distributions that you're optimizing. And there is this very nice uh, idea that I think so far has not really been well understood, but there is this idea that the process of training a neural network is very similar to what we call the renormalization group flow in physics. So this kind of sequence of training is the way we think about it in physics is that different microscopic theories uh, will sort of flow to the same setup. So if we're, for instance, interested in understanding the temperature of this room, we don't have to know the details of each single atom, and so on. So you have some kind of macroscopic description. There is this very nice way of thinking about this due to Kadanov, which is called the block spin renormalization, that if you have an Ising model with, with spins, Maybe you don't have to know what all the spins are doing, so you say I'm taking a block and I'm replacing it with some effective spin. <coughs> and, you're, and you're doing this sequentially. And this is exactly like the kind of coarse graining that we're doing in uh, training a neural network. So it suggests that you have some kind of universal property of neural network, at least of this kind, and this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to understand. I have a picture of a river and I'm gonna Skip, you can ask me about the river later. Um, taking it one step further, um, you can also ask about, uh, so if you have an Ising model or a Hamiltonian, it's natural to ask about quantum structures. So this is going toward in, in the direction of, of quantum uh, computers, but you're just interested in understanding the dynamics of some quantum system. And what you can ask about what kind of energy does the system have if you have a many-body system, this turns out to be a difficult problem. So there are various techniques, tensor networks, quantum Monte Carlo, and so on. Um, <coughs> you can do this, but there was some very interesting progress uh, a few years ago when uh, Carleo and Troyer used machine learning to model uh, sort of the ground state and the dynamics of a quantum system. And they did it using this kind of Boltzmann machine. So this exponential here in the, in the exponential there is like the energy function that I showed you before. And you're summing over this H, which represents sort of the hidden structure. So you're marginalizing over some hidden layer, and you get a model distribution. And you have an optimization problem of finding the ground state by minimizing the energy. So they used this very successfully, and they were able to uh, sort of sample a wave function and then use some optimization scheme to get a very good uh, estimate of the ground state. So this kind of gave uh, a way in 
applying machine learning to quantum physics. Uh, but we want to go the other way. So <coughs> this is my uh, last slide, so I think I'm on time. So what about trying to go, if you have some kind of model uh, where you're using machine learning to understand quantum physics, can you somehow take that in the other direction? Uh, well, in, in uh, quantum systems, you have this notion of entanglement. You can have quantum states that are <coughs> non-trivially entangled, which is sort of the opposite of them being just products and not interacting with each other. And the way we think about this is we have some system and we're dividing it into two regions, A and B. And you're asking sort of how entangled two quantum states are by computing what's called the entanglement entropy. You can think of it as sort of a quantum analog of, of Shannon's information entropy. And one very fascinating thing is that when you look at uh, certain very special states, they satisfy what's called an area law. So the entanglement entropy, which is sort of measuring how much entanglement you have, is proportional to the area of the boundary of this region. And this is kind of counterintuitive, because usually when you think about entropy as a measure of some disorder, like uh, <coughs> in this room, the entropy will scale like the volume of the system. So here you have some kind of suppression where you just have an area law. So this has been used to give a measure of sort of long-range uh, long correlations in neural networks, and it's been also proposed to be used as a sort of a guideline for, uh, for deep learning architectures. And uh, for me, uh, this kind of area law is also something that I'm very familiar with from a completely different setting. Namely, if you're interested in understanding the entropy of a black hole, then typically what you have is you have some microscopic, well, that's the hypothesis, you have a microscopic uh, <coughs> description of, of your system, and then it turns out that according to Hawking, the entropy of a black hole should scale like the area of the black hole. So there is some kind of uh, similar type of suppression here of information that uh, seems very intriguing, and, and many people have tried to understand how we can use this to understand at least a class of neural networks. <coughs> so just to summarize, if you want to have one take-home message, uh, well, there is some very interesting cross-fertilization between physics, mathematics, and deep learning, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's coming right now. And maybe for, you know, for you guys, it's not something that you will be using for the next year or the next two years, but, you know, in basic research, we have a timeline of 100 years, so... <coughs> So you, know, you have to be patient. Uh, but so what questions that we are currently looking into is, is in particular this kind of renormalization, if this somehow is a universal property of neural networks or a class of them. Uh, <coughs> we want to pursue uh, relations with quantum information theory, if that somehow can give us new insights into neural networks. And also, let me just, the final thing is we want to really be able to use this kind of idea of conservation laws to say something about neural networks which have some kind of symmetries. So there's a lot of stuff to do, and so thank you. Great, thank you very much. Are there questions in the audience? Anyone? Ah, great. Otherwise, I'm thinking about the rivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was expecting. <laughs> so, would you say that it's uh, inherently exclusive to uh, neural networks or uh, like deep learning? But would you be able to like apply the weight translation to other models, model types? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. I mean, we have so far been focusing a lot on the Boltzmann machines, but I mean, th th you can certainly ask, what about in general neural networks? Uh, can you talk about this kind of notion of entanglement, for instance? So I think that's very interesting, and some some groups have looked at this um, what are convolutional arithmetic circuits and so on, which is a little bit different, and they also seem to find some kind of notion of entanglement there. And so yeah, oh, okay, yeah, great. Anyone else? Good question. Uh, a leading question, Joseph. So, so you know that the renormalization group is very much about the changing of scale. Yeah. 
But to me, it seems like this is very different from when you're training a neural network. It's, it's, abs it's very far from changing scale. Uh, maybe some, some applications, it's a change of scale, but for many networks, it's something completely different. So, so, it's, so I think it's important to mention that renormalization is used in very different ways. So in particular in quantum field theory, indeed it's about looking at the physics above or below some energy scale. But in the point of view that Kadanov was advocating this uh, <coughs> sort of uh, block, scheme, block, block spin renormalization, it's not really changing the energy scale, but it's, sort of, it, it's another scale, it's scaling up the system. So you're coarse graining, so you're throwing away degrees of freedom. And it's in that sense that it's very similar to the kind of thing you have, for instance, in an autoencoder when you're compressing information, but you want to retain kind of the essential details. But for many networks, you have as many parameters as you would have data points. Yep. So when you're training, you're not, ac not actually throwing away information. Yeah. So yeah, it's very good questions. And I don't really know what is the answer to this. So in, in a sort of limited uh, set of examples, there seems to be an analogy, but we don't really know how, you know, how general this is, so I agree. Super exciting. It's really cool that we have a, a private foundation that is putting money into this stuff. Yeah, and they I give mean, a lot. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool, yeah. Okay, thank you <laughs> very much. <laughs>